Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for having me. And so today I'm going to talk about some quantitative analyses that I have done of data that have been collected by exhaustive field work done by um, a number of people, including Spencer Lucas and Bill DeMichael. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a brief outline of what I'm going to discuss today. I'm going to talk um, first, just give an introduction, then I'll give some background into the field area, the geology, the paleobotany, um, there's a lot of photos, and then I will get into the statistical analyses that I have done of changes in the floral composition, um, mostly looking at the Casimovian. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a tiny cartoon example that I made of cyclothems um, within the Moscovian and the Casimovian. This is the traditional idea that people have about this boundary where you have a very dramatic shift from wet to dry. Next slide, please. And this is a very canonical image that I'm sure that a lot of people have seen. Um, based on the Phillips et al. paper in Science in 1974. So this is with palynological data, excuse me, and these data are from the interior of Pangaea. And particularly if you look at the clades that are color-coded, we see a very, very dramatic shift where we lose many, many species um, at this boundary. Uh, next slide, please. And so this canonical idea of what happened at this boundary is based primarily on the interior of Euro-American Pangaea. So this is based on the Illinois and the Appalachian basins. And then there still remains the question of what happened at equatorial areas that are farther from the interior of Pangaea. Next slide, please. And so the floras that I will be talking about today are from far western Euro-American Pangaea, though they still are located very close to the Paleo Equator. Next slide, please. And so this is just a very basic overview of the formations in this area. And the Amato event, which is marked with a limestone, that is marked in red um, across essentially the middle of this slide. And we can see that there are three formations in this area, mainly the Sandia, Grey Mesa, and Atrasado. The Sandia, uh, I'm not going to discuss today, but the Sandia is the closest thing essentially to a coal um, in this area of Pangaea. And it does include a whole lot of Lepidodendron that we then do not see in the Grey Mesa Formation and the Atrasado Formation, which is what I will primarily be discussing today. Next slide, please. And so this here, which you are seeing, this is a screenshot of an abstract from a recent vertebrate paleontology paper. And I myself am not a vertebrate paleontologist. I do not have any opinion on whether or not what they're saying here is accurate, but I wanted to show it because um, the message that they are conveying in this abstract to me is very interesting. So if you look at the parts of this abstract that I have highlighted, what they are saying is that among amniotes, so again, this is with vertebrates, among amniotes, what happens as we go from the Carboniferous to the Permian is that dryland adapted faunas from far western Pangaea, then migrate into the center, the, into the interior of Pangaea. And in that sense, we can think of this transition as, a trans, as not so much a transition in which we go from one state to another, but a transition in which the interior of Pangaea starts to look more and more like far western Pangaea as this transition progresses. Next slide, please. So I myself am a paleoentomologist. I study insects. And for insects, we do not have the same kind of granularity of the data whatsoever. Um, we, we do not have as good of a sense of what happened for insects as we have for what happened with crinoids or vertebrates or plants. Um, nevertheless, we can say that the Casimovian occurs temporally at, at the precipice of a very important transition. And 
That's because there have been two main evolutionary faunas of insects in deep time. And so these are not monophyletic clades, they are more ecological assemblages. And so these only two faunas, the first is the Paleozoic insect fauna, and the second is the modern insect fauna. The Paleozoic insect fauna is dominated by what are called Paleopterous insects. These are relatives of dragonflies and mayflies that we have today. These are insects that cannot fold their wings behind their back. They can only hold their wings out. So if you think about um, what it looks like when a dragonfly is resting, maybe it's holding its wings out. Maybe it has its wings next to its abdomen, but it never has its wings folded on its abdomen. Right? And so this is the ancestral state for all winged insects, but most winged insects that we have today are able to fold their wings flat um, on their back, on their abdomen. And so Paleoptera, they dominated the Paleozoic insect fauna. And we can think of the entire Permian period essentially as a transition from the Paleozoic insect fauna to the modern insect fauna. It's a transition that happened very gradually. And then just below the PT boundary, we do see some of the iconic Paleopterous orders or, that were dominant during the Pennsylvanian completely gone. And so the Triassic looks completely different from the Pennsylvanian in that sense. Um, and speaking of the Pennsylvanian, the very first winged insects that we have in the fossil record occurred just before the Mississippian and Pe Mississippian Pennsylvanian boundary. And insects explode all over the planet and become the dominant terrestrial arthropod group um, as soon as we get into the Pennsylvanian. So it's a very rapid transition in which we go from having no winged insects at all and a very, very, very spotty fossil record of non-winged insects. So all of a sudden winged insects appear to have taken over the planet. The reason why I'm mentioning this is that if we look at the Moscovian Casamovian boundary, or if we look at what's happening within the Casamovian, nothing much happens at all in terms of insects, at least in this broad sense. Of course, there are always genera and families that are becoming more or less abundant, but we do not see the sort of dramatic transition that we see in the amniote fauna or the sort of transition that we see with the plants in the interior of Pangaea in which, you know, you, you, you really are going from one state to another and you lose a lot of iconic taxa. We do not see that in or even really near the Casamobian, excuse me. And that's particularly notable because the fossil record of insects isn't great, <laughs> but it is better during the Pennsylvanian than it is during the Permian. We have a pretty good fossil record for insects throughout the Pennsylvanian, and it doesn't contain the sort of granularity that would allow us to really see migrations in any detail, but still, we just don't see these sorts of state changes. Next slide, please. Okay, so here, I am showing another abstract from a pretty recent paper that has come out during the past 10 years. And this also includes a photo of one of the fossils. And this is a trigonotarbid. Trigonotarbids are arachnids. They kind of look like spiders, but they're not spiders. And trigonotarbids were some of the most common arachnids that we see throughout the Paleozoic. And they are like trilobites in that they are declining throughout the Permian, and then by the PT, we do not have them anymore. And trigonotarbids go back to the Silurian. So trigonotarbids are approximately as old as vascular plants. The oldest trigonotarbid is about as old as Baraguanathia, which is the oldest vascular plants. For that reason, it is difficult to think of trigonotarbids as being dependent on the rainforests that we had during the Carboniferous because trigonotarbids predate these rainforests by many tens of millions of years. Uh, but nevertheless, as you can see, if you look at the portion of this abstract that is highlighted on this slide, we do lose trigonotarbids around the same time as we lose rainforests. And so the authors are saying that we should not infer any kind of causal relationship. Um, the data simply aren't there. And there are any number of stratigraphic biases and sampling biases that one could also um, consider as potential explanations for why we stop seeing trigonotarbids when we do stop seeing them. Um, the point being generally 
that um, there are all kinds of animals that are directly and indirectly reliant on the flora. And we don't have a ton of resolution for all of them. We don't have the same resolution for terrestrial arthropods as we have for amniotes. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there, there are gonna be changes that occur within any temporal period that includes tens of millions of years or you know, at least a couple million years. It's difficult to line these up with any quote unquote carboniferous rainforest collapse. Next slide, please. And so this here, um, it's a chart that I, has, you have seen multiple times before, but it's just showing how the North American stages line up with the official geologic time scale. Next slide, please. And um, so here we can just see a little bit more detail because today I am going to be discussing these flowers in the context of the North American stages. So if we look somewhat towards the bottom, the Atokan stage, that is where we have the Lepidodendron in New Mexico and far western Pangaea. And today I'm going to be talking about the Des Moines and Missourian transition. So essentially confined to the Casamovian. Next slide, please. And here is a map where we can see the Saqqara Basin. And so that is where these floras are from. And this is in present day New Mexico. Next slide, please. And so here we have a little bit more detail of what I'm going to be talking about today. So there are some data from the Gray Mesa Formation. Most of the data are from the Atrasado Formation. And this sequence does include the Amato limestone, which you can see marked with that red arrow. And there's a number of cyclothems within that. So there's um, compressed time within there. Um, but the members that I'm going to be talking about today are um, almost every member that, it, that is listed here. So there's, there's quite a bit of time. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to show a series of photos. These were provided by Spencer Lucas and Bill Michael, as you can see on the slides. And so this is showing the field area for Cerro de Amato. Next slide, please. So here you can see the Amato member that is underlain by the Bartolo member. And this is one of many, many fossil plant beds that you can see in this photo. Next slide, please. Okay, so here is another view of the Bartolo and the Amato. And so there are these four different beds within the Bartolo that you can see indicated on this slide. And what's interesting is that three of the Bartolo beds that are shown here are a lock finesse. So these are beds in which plant material has been transported in from somewhere else. And then in the uppermost of these beds, Bartolo 4, that is autochthonous, which means that these plant specimens have been preserved in situ. Next slide, please. So here are a couple examples of the plants that we have in the Bartolo. So here I am showing wetland plants. And so, so many of the plants that you think of as just having existed during the Pennsylvanian in general, we do see in, um, in this section. And so these are the more wetland adapted plants in this photo. So we have Neuropterus, which is a seed plant. And we also have um, something closely related to Picopterus or very similar to Picopterus. And we have Calamides, which is not a seed plant. Next slide, please. And here are some of the more uh, dry adapted plants, plants that do better in seasonally dry environments. So we have Sphenopteridium on the left. We have Walchia in the middle. So this is a conifer. So um, very much, uh, very, very different from Lepidodendron, for example. Next slide, please. And here is um, another field photo showing um, uh, autochthonous fossil flora bed. So um, once again, we have plants that are preserved in C2 in some of the beds below the Amato limestone. Um, and in this case, it's dominated by Neuropterus bovada. Next slide, please. So um, here are some photos of what we see in the autochthonous Neuroptera bed. So this is right below the Amato limestone, and this 
is very similar by the standards of our Western Pangaea to a coal bed. It is an organic rich mudstone. So this um, is emblematic of the closest thing that exists in this area to um, a lowland in situ um, flora. Well, it, it is a lowland in situ flora, and this is from the late Demonian. Next slide, please. Um, and so this, again, is another example of um, fossil neuropterus from this area. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we can see the Des Moines and Missourian beds. We can see the Amato limestone that separates them. And towards the right in this photo, you can see that there is a gypsum bed that we get once we are in the Missourian. Next slide, please. So this gypsum bed, it extends for a number of kilometers. And so I have a couple of photos and these photos are taken pretty far away from each other. It's a very widespread unit. And so what we have is a thick micrite with tree stumps that is covered by a gypsum bed. And this gypsum bed can be up to three meters thick. Um, it's, well, it's a carbonate bed with gypsum in it. And it's very irregularly preserved um, nowadays um, due to um, its susceptibility to modern dissolution and weathering. Next slide, please. So this is a, um, another photo of the gypsum bed that I think was taken a couple kilometers from the photo that I showed on the previous slide. And so the plant fossils that you can see are uh, in the dark shell that's underneath the gypsum bed. And what we see underneath the gypsum bed is that we have entirely drought tolerant plants, right? And then the gypsum bed itself um, only contains coniferophytes. So um, yes, and you, you could see in the previous slide as well. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so, so yes, so here is another photo and this is where it is easiest to see the upright tree that is um, indicated with an arrow in the middle. Um, of the photograph. Next slide, please. All right. And so here are some examples of the plants that we see in the organic shale below the gypsum. So there's Charlia, there is Walchia once again. So this is another photo of a conifer, Lodivia, and Sphenopteridium. Next slide, please. All right, and so here we are getting up into the olive shale. So this is an alochthonous flora. Next slide, please. And so here, um, just in this one hand sample, we can see a number of different plants. So we have Meradialian ferns, as well as yet more um, Walchia conifers. There's a, a couple of different Walchian conifer morphotypes, um, as well as more Charlia. Next slide, please. Right. And so here we have uh, yet more examples of plants. So there is, um, yeah, so the, we have mainly, um, we have two pteridosperms, we have a conifer, and we have an equisitalian calamites. So this is related to ferns. Next slide, please. All right, so now I'm going to get into the statistical analyses that I did. So with all of these beds, there are 68 localities um, with USNM numbers. And for 44 of these 68 beds, there are count data. So not only do we have presence absence for individual taxa, but we have um, data on their abundance. And in 32 of these 44 beds, there are at least 15 specimens. So the analyses that I did are of those 32 beds. So it's less than half of the total number of beds, but these are the beds for which we have the most data. Next slide, please. So this here is um, essentially uh, just a heat map. And so each of the beds are arranged um, vertically, stratigraphically. And this is divided by plant taxa. So these are higher taxa that have been lumped together. And the gray bars indicate that a taxon is rare or absent at a particular bed. And then the, as the bars become more and more dark blue, that indicates that the taxa are more and more prevalent within those beds. And so um, at the left, we have the lycopsids and calamites. So these are very wet adapted plants. And then as we get towards the right here, 
We have conifers, we have pteridosperms. So pteridosperms includes a number of things, including medullose and tree ferns, but the conifers are dry adapted. And then the insertecetus category that you see here, this includes Teneopterus and Charlia. So those again are relatively dry adapted plants. Um, and what's interesting to see here is that um, both below and above the Amato member, we don't see many differences. It doesn't appear that there is a, a very dramatic change um, above and below the Amato event. Next slide, please. So now what I'm going to show is a heat map that illustrates differences between these beds. And so I measured these differences using something called turnover, but essentially what turnover measures is how different are the plant taxa that we see between these two beds. So this is a component of beta diversity. So each square in this chart represents a comparison between two different beds. And the beds are arranged, of course, stratigraphically, both on the horizontal and the vertical axes. And when I show you the squares that are colored in, squares that are red indicate major differences between the two beds, and squares that are blue indicate that the beds are very similar to each other. Next slide, please. So these are not my results. This is just a hypothetical result. This is showing what we would expect to see if the, if the beds from the Des Moines and the Missourian are very different from each other. So in the lower left of this chart, where we have a comparison of Des Moines beds with Des Moines beds, those squares are colored in blue, indicating that Des Moines beds are very similar to each other. And in the upper right, we see the same thing, but for the Missourian. So the blue squares in the upper right would indicate that the Missourian beds are very similar to each other. And this rectangle that is dark red, that is what we will see if the Des Moines and Missourian beds are very different from each other. So again, this is not my real result. This is a hypothetical result, but it's showing what we would expect if there was a dramatic transition um, at the Amato event. So now I will show you my actual results. Next slide, please. So these are my real results. <laughs> and so there's, there's a black line that is marking off where that rectangle is on the previous slide. And so that's marking the um, boundary between the Des Moines and Missourian. And there is essentially no difference. Um, the Des Moines beds are not more similar to each other than they are to the Missourian beds. And similarly, the Missourian beds are not more similar to each other than they are to the Des Moines beds. And if I had not marked off using that black line, the boundary between the Des Moines and the Missourian, I don't think it would be possible <laughs> to, 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 to guess where that boundary would be. So we're just seeing no difference, no transition at all from the Des Moines to the Missourian. Next slide, please. So what I was showing in the previous slide, the measures of turnover of beta diversity, that is using only presence absence data. So we don't have a sense of how abundant things are. And similarly, I had lumped all of these taxa together. An example in the pteridosperms, some pteridosperms are wet adapted and some are dry adapted, but I was just coding them all as pteridosperms in the previous slide. And so I wanted to do analyses that are more nuanced because even as we go from a wet climate to a dry climate, if that is what's happening, we still would expect a number of taxa to persist, but we'd expect them to, them to change in their rank abundance. If you look at the histograms that are along the bottom of the slide, these are showing what one might expect to see as a transition occurs from a wet to a dry climate. Um, and so the bars in the histogram, you know, each bar represents a plant taxon. These are organized from left to right along the x-axis by their rank abundance. And then the y-axis shows the proportion of the flora that they comprise. And these bars are co colored in blue for wet adapted taxa, and they're colored in brown for dry adapted taxa. And so what this is showing is simply that even if you have a wet adapted flora, you would expect a number of dry adapted taxa. And particularly in a dry adapted flora, you'd expect a number of wet adapted taxa, right? And you would simply expect them to be relatively rare. 
right? And so this might not happen in a coal or in a roof shale. There you might see only wet adapted taxa. But certainly if you think about a, an adpression flora where most of the plants are dry adapted, you still would expect some wetland plants to, um, to come in. You would simply expect them to be rare because there's always going to be you know, a wet spot on the landscape when you have fossil preservation. And so this essentially shows the pitfalls of using only presence absence data, because particularly, you know, in any assemblage, there are going to be um, a number of plants that are very rare. And those rare plants might be the ones that are least characteristic of the environment in general. So if we restrict ourselves to presence absence data, we can actually find ourselves in a situation where more complete sampling and more sampling effort would lead us to um, a misleading conclusion because we would be, you know, overstating the importance of very rare taxa in the analyses. Next slide, please. So what I did was a procedure that is intended to quantify our uncertainty of whether a flora is comprised mainly of wet adapted or dry adapted taxa. So there are three goals. One is more granular detail. So pteridosperms are no longer all lumped together. Instead, the data are coded by species. And so we have data on whether each individual species is wet or dry adapted. Um, another goal is to account for abundance, um, as I was showing with the histograms in the previous slide, that is very important. And then also to quantify our uncertainty. So generating an entire distribution of estimates instead of only one point estimate. And so the way that I did this was with a resampling procedure where I resampled all beds to 100 specimens, whether the original raw data set included hundreds of specimens or only 20 specimens. And then I calculated the proportion of specimens of those 100 that I resampled that are wet adapted. And I repeated this procedure 10,000 times. Next slide, please. So here you can see the results that I got. The Amato event is marked with a uh, gray dashed line. And the way this is organized is that on the x-axis, this is stratigraphic. So we are going from the Des Moines into the Missourian. And then on the y-axis, what I have is the proportion of fossils belonging to wet adapted taxa. So if a flora, if its distribution is higher up towards one, that's wet adapted, and then lower down towards zero, that's dry adapted. And of the 32 flowers that I looked at, here we are seeing five that are closest to the Amato event. And this is consistent with a very abrupt and dramatic transition from wet adapted to dry adapted flowers. Um, next slide, please. So here we can see all 32 of the beds instead of only five that are close to the Amato event. And as you can see, there really is no pattern. We have these very regular swings between wet and dry adapted. So we're going back and forth. And so the pattern essentially is that there is no pattern at all. The amplitude of those of the shifts from wet adapted to dry adapted flowers, that amplitude does decrease as we go farther and farther up in the Missourian. But that's really it. We do not see a state change from a wet state to a dry state. Next slide, please. Then the very last thing I'm going to talk about with one minute left is that I did a change point analysis. And this analysis is exactly what it sounds like when you have a time series, as we have here with these floras, um, you can run analysis that will detect the point at which you had a state change from one state to another. And this of course is a cartoon example, but if we did have a very neat transition from wet adapted to dry adapted floras, we would be able to pick out the change point. And so here the change point itself is denoted with the black circle. And then there's the line denoting a confidence interval, which that would be very narrow if the, if the state change is very neat and clean. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide and I ran the change point analysis on these data and essentially there was no change point detected in that the confidence interval for the change point spans the entire time series. So that is just a statistical confirmation of what we can already see with our own eyes that there is no state change out in far western Pangaea during this interval. And so the floras here, um, particularly during the Missourian, but regardless, they almost seem more Permian than Pennsylvanian because you have a lot of Teneopterus. And of course, Teneopterus, things like that is what we see um, much more widespread. 
as time goes on and we go from the Pennsylvanian to the Permian. And with that, I would like to thank everyone who did all this field work for inviting me to be a part of this project. And I will happily take any questions. All right, th thank you, Sandra. Um, we're open for questions. Um, I would wanna make, let me make one comment before questions. This section we worked on, Bill DeMichael, myself, many others, uh, we collected for about 20 years. But a really important point in this section is the section is non-marine rocks intercalated with marine limestones. And we were really fortunate to have Jim Barrick working with us. And Jim Barrick did all the conodont work on the marine limestones. And so you can really dial these floras into the time scale based on the conodont biostratigraphy in a very precise way. So I think it's, a, uh, it's not only a section in Western Pangaea that's loaded with plants, but it's a section where the age control is, is exceptional, really thanks to Jim's work. Anyway, questions? Well, then, then I have a question. What, what happened to the Carboniferous Rainforest collapse? You killed it, Sandra. There, the whole meeting, we shouldn't have even had a meeting, right? There's no Carboniferous Rainforest collapse in Western Pangaea. What's going on? Well, <laughs> um, I... You, it's already very well known that the loss of the arborescent lycopsids did not occur synchronously throughout the planet, right? It did not happen in China at the same time that it happened in other places. And so I think that, you know, the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse can always live on in our hearts, but... Um, <laughs> But, but but the point being that, you know, it's it's never that simple, right? No, nothing is that simple. And if you think about, you know, um, how the increase in PCO2 that's occurring right now, that it, that has impacted different parts of the planet in different ways. And that doesn't only depend on the biome that you have and on your latitude, but, you know, the you know, due to due to any number of things and, you know, whether it's um, atmospheric circulation, whatever it may be, changes are happening um, with different magnitudes and at different times, even if the directionality of the change is the same. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're losing your arborescent lycopsids, you wouldn't expect that to happen um, as dramatically and at the same time, absolutely everywhere. Okay, good. Um, Jorg has a question. Jorg, you're muted. You need to um, unmute. First, the comment. You know, I like cockroaches very much, <laughs> and uh, concerning uh, the evolution of insects, so the, the biodiversity of insects. Interestingly, at the transition from the Moscovian to the Casimovian, one cockroach crop, the so called Archimulagris, disappeared completely. They were dominant during the uh, nearly whole Moscovian and then gone. And this in Europe and North America as well. Uh, also, the number of Müller creeds, uh, the uh, biodiversity of Müller creeds, get very fast uh, restricted. And on the other hand, uh, in the start of the Casimovian, appear from Europe, North Africa, uh, uh, North America, all those typical cockroaches which we could uh, see up into the early pyramid. In the entomophana, cockroach, cockroach fauna, <laughs> there's a drastic change, really. Uh, concerning uh, lycopsids. Yeah, this may be uh, time graphic, not synchronous. Uh, as I told you, and it's well known, in the transition of Westphalian B to Westphalian C, we have the last uh, marine incursion in the European world's conformity. After that, uh, appear first bad red bats, 
and all th this huge area with very wet soils uh, start to dry. And therefore, the habitats of leucorp seeds disappear. Uh, this may be not uh, uh, synchronous to that what happened in uh, Western Pangea, where we have marine incursions still up into the early Permian. Okay, thank you. Nice talk. Nice. <laughs> I like <laughs> it. Uh, even in these sections, uh, Bottolo member, Tinarius member, we have this, this typical uh, post Moscovian endomorphana, uh, cockroach fauna, cockroach fauna. We have good samples from there, thanks to the team of Spencer and Bill. So, if I could ask you one question. Yeah. Um, how often do you see a transition within the cockroach faunas? The first and most important one at the uh, Moscovian Casimorian transition. This is very impressive. And the next one, yeah. end of early pyramid. There appear uh, well, then, during the, the late Cicero appear those forms which became dominant in the late Permian and uh, in the transition to the Triassic. But but a real real sh uh, sharp uh, uh, change is at the Moscovian Casimovian boundary. Maybe similar shop to the PD boundary. <laughs> okay, and um, and and Bill has a comment. Uh, Bill to Michael. Back again. Um, just I think the uh, just a comment on the Carboniferous rainforest collapse. I, I think that when that term was first used, I believe it was in a paper on vertebrates, uh, in which Howard Falcon Lang was the co-author, mm -hmm. and. Um, I think it's been picked up and, and generalized in a way that's unfortunate because really you, you had the, what it should have said in a more complex way was the middle Pennsylvanian rainforest collapsed in the mid continent or in the, in the middle of Pangaea. And it was replaced by a tree fern dominated rainforest. It, it wasn't replaced by a desert. And the idea that, that, um, the central part of Pangaea was becoming more like Western Pangaea. Well, it did that repeatedly all the way through the early and middle Pennsylvania because you had glacial interglacial cycles. And during, as, as other people have pointed out already during this meeting, during parts of those cycles, the, the climate was relatively drier and during other parts, the climate was relatively wetter. That shows in the paleosols and the thickness of the coals and all that sort of thing. Um, so it, it, didn't, it wasn't just wet and then it got dry. It was wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. And then and how dry did it get during the dry periods and how wet was it during the wet periods are the, the questions we should be looking at. So, so rainforest type one might have collapsed, but it was replaced by rainforest type two. So it, it's, it's not like the whole thing went away. I think Sandra understands that, and it was yeah. So this, but just this is just goes back to this. What's good this perception? Yeah, let, and finally, let me make one comment too that I'm struck by. We seem our world, our Carboniferous world, goes from somewhere like Oklahoma to the Czech Republic, and a lot of what we think we know about the Carboniferous world only comes from that stretch of real estate. So when we talk about global patterns. We're not really talking about global things. And even, for example, even with the crinoids, we have a limitation to their data set, you know, from, from somewhere in Russia to somewhere in, in Illinois or whatever. And we have to be careful. I think these data from far Western Pangaea, as Bill and Sandra both said, uh, urge caution in claiming global patterns for patterns that we're really seeing in one equatorial province, uh, Pangean tropics, if you will, of your America. Anyway, uh, 
I'll let that be the last word now since I've ran us out of time. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Excellent talk. We're going to move on to the next speaker, who is Cortland Ebel, who's going to talk about uh, changes in the polynomorphs across the Moscovian uh, Casimovian boundary. Cortland, please.